morning to everyone or afternoon. I'm briefly introduced. I, I work for the European Commission, uh, DG Migration and Home Affairs, and I'm in the International Strategy Unit, with, which um, deals with the external relations of DG Home. And in my unit, I am responsible for covering legal migration issues, among other things. So that is where the talent partnerships fall into. Um, I would like to start by stating the obvious. The EU is an aging continent, and in many economic sectors and regions, there are labor shortages that can be filled by labor, market, labor migrants. Uh, migrant workers have shown their vital contribution as key workers during the COVID-19 pandemic, notably healthcare and seasonal workers, but not only them. Europe needs legal migrants and needs to be able to attract them in the global race for talent. At the same time, the EU is aware of partner countries' concerns about brain drain and takes these concerns seriously. Well-designed mobility partnerships can provide us with the right skills and talents while contributing to the development of migrants' countries of origin at the same time. And that is the aim of the new talent partnerships concept I would like to present today. Talent partnerships are one of the European Commission's key proposals in the recently announced new Pact on Migration and Asylum, which is a package of major EU reform proposals in the area of migration and asylum. Talent partnerships aim to provide a comprehensive policy framework, as well as funding support for mutually beneficial cooperation with partner countries in order to attract talented students, researchers and workers to the EU. The talent partnerships would combine direct support for mobility schemes for work or training with capacity building in areas such as labor market or skills intelligence, vocational education and training, integration of returning migrants and diaspora mobilization. They would reflect real labor market demand and supply in EU and partner countries and meet the interests of countries of origin, countries of destination and the migrants themselves. They could be temporary, long-term or circular in nature and be open to all skill levels, not only high skills, but also medium and low skills. Talent partnerships would also concern various different economic sectors in need of labor in the EU, such as ICT, science, engineering, healthcare and long-term care in view of the demographic trends in Europe, um, agriculture, horticulture, food processing and tourism, once the pandemic is over, of course. Although there is no geographic limitation, according to the pact, talent partnerships should be launched first in the EU's neighborhood, the Western Balkans and in Africa with a view to expanding to other regions at a later stage. Each talent partnership would be developed within the framework of the overall engagement and dialogue of the European Union with the partner country on migration. In order for these schemes to work, the engagement of EU member states partner countries and the involvement of stakeholders such as employers and social partners, education and training providers and diaspora associations, NGOs and many others who can contribute to these schemes will be essential. We have therefore held a number of consultations with various stakeholders such as a recent video conference with our Commissioner for Home Affairs, Ilva Johansson and representatives of business associations and social partners. Further consultations with EU member states will take place in the weeks and months ahead in order to finalize the concept and begin operationalizing it. With regard to the timeline, talent partnerships are planned to be formally launched at a high level conference in the coming months. As um, Alexander mentioned, towards the summer, we hope to be able to launch these before the summer break, um, but the, the exact timing has not been set yet. Concrete actions would follow on a rolling basis and gradually increase in scope and size. This gradual rollout will draw on the lessons learned from existing labor and student mobility pilot projects with countries in the EU's neighborhood, which have been implemented mainly through the EU funded mobility partnership facility, the MPF, um, implemented by CMPD since 2018. The next speaker, Diana Stefanescu, is involved in the MPF's implementation and is much more familiar with the details of the pilot projects. And she will go into more detail about the lessons we can learn from them. But I would like to highlight that these pilots form the conceptual basis for the talent partnerships. Our goal is to scale up the pilot projects, not necessarily specific ones, but the projects approach in general and build capacities that can facilitate 
many more mobilities over the long term than the very limited numbers which we can achieve through small scale projects. Because as you will hear, um, the pilot projects so far have been rather limited in scope, but that was of course the, by design as we were piloting this idea and now we are looking to step, move into the next stage and scale them up. Finally, I would like to say that bilateral experiences outside of the MPF framework, such as the one to be, to be presented by Mario Lelovsky uh, later on in the panel, are also valuable sources of inspiration for the talent partnerships. And I would be interested in hearing about any other existing bilateral schemes which the Commission may not be aware of, which could help us develop our concept and um, sharpen some of the, some of the um, details, let's say, before we launch them formally. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to the open discussion. Diana, I will pass on the floor to you. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you for these very uh, interesting opening remarks setting the scene a little bit uh, for what we will be discussing later on also with Mario. First of all, just a, a big thank you also from my side for the invitation for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, we're always eager and excited to share the lessons we have learned uh, from our work in the mobility partnership facility, uh, from the implementation and accompaniment of the AMEF funded pilot projects on legal migration. Just a quick word about myself. I'm a project specialist uh, on working on labor migration, specifically in the mobility partnership facility run by ICMPD. Uh, I have a background in political science. I have studied uh, the mobility partnerships actually at the time. The, so uh, uh, another EU policy framework, a bit of an older one, uh, already during my time at university, I uh, was very interested in, in EU migration policy, ended up working for the German, German Federal Office for Migration and Refugees, and uh, since 2018 I have been with ICMPD in the Mobility Partnership Facility, and so I have accompanied the, yeah, the, the launch and the rollout of this pilot, these pilot projects, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to share a few more words about them uh, with you today. Um, a little background, maybe even though there's no dedicated slide on it, but just the, about the mobility partnership facility. We have been around for uh, longer than the pilot projects. Uh, we exist already since 2016 and, and basically represent a funding framework or a funding uh, kind of mechanism uh, that uh, the European Commission and more specifically DG Home uses to finance all sorts of partnership projects between member states and uh, partner countries outside of the European Union. Uh, that advance uh, in numerous ways the, the cooperation on migration. So we're quite a, yeah, a multifaceted facility with a lot of different topics that we cover from integration, asylum to border management uh, and uh, also legal migration. My, uh, my particular focus and my work is on legal migration. And I'll tell you a little bit about the EU pilot projects. Um, they have been launched in 2018 by the Commission uh, in response actually already to uh, the European agenda on migration and uh, the, yeah, the various calls basically upon the European Union to expand and to make available dedicated funding for legal migration opportunities. Um, so they designed this framework that would basically uh, allow uh, projects to receive or countries to receive funding that want to implement a bilateral or multilateral mobility scheme uh, between a country in the European Union and a country outside of the European Union to offer um, tangible, safe and legal migration pathways for people who would like to move for work and study purposes or study purposes. Um, and the idea for them was already at the time that they would try to contribute to addressing labor shortages both in the European Union, but also taking into account the interests and the needs uh, uh, of the partner countries. Uh, so it was really designed as a tool uh, to fund projects that will help facilitate and develop cooperation with third countries overall. Um, all of these projects uh, were supposed to and also ended up actually covering four distinct pillars that are kind of now uh, a standard part of, of, of those mobility projects. They usually have a capacity building component that helps the institutions that are uh, participating in the projects on both sides, countries of origin and country of destination, to, um, to reap the benefits of legal migration. So to kind of like uh, enhance their capacities to deal with labor migration on both sides. 
Um, the projects usually also have a, a distinct pre-departure component. So they prepare the migrants through training. Sometimes it can be uh, vocational training, actual like enhancing their, their, their skills and competences in the particular sector they're working in, or it can be soft skills. It can also be cultural preparation, language. Um, they usually have and have to have uh, in order to be eligible for this uh, framework uh, a mobility component that means that people have to actually move uh, um, for work or for study. Uh, there we see uh, different and I'll tell you a little bit more about it there's different frameworks for that sometimes we have temporary migration short term for three or six months for training purposes, uh, but also a project that aim at recruiting uh, candidates longer term for permanent migration to fill uh, permanent labor shortages just in the European member states. Um, we also have usually either a reintegration or an integration component, depending on if the migration is permanent or circular, uh, where basically uh, um, resources and activities are spent on uh, on uh, on helping the candidates to yeah to integrate and 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 uh, uh, stay connected to their new societies or to reintegrate upon return when they return to their countries of origin so that they can basically make the most of their experience, their migration experience when they return. And for example, they receive support, uh, finding a job back home or uh, starting their own company. There's different modalities for that. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, we have some examples already that I can tell you about. So in 2018, the first round of funding was launched. There was a call for proposals published and uh, you see here the projects that basically came out of that. There's the four MPF funded projects, Palim, Digital Explorers, YGCA, and Omer. But I'm also mentioning here, even though they're not directly funded through the Mobility Partnership Facility, there is the TAM project and the MATCH project um, that are a bigger size project, but have a very similar approach to their mobility uh, schemes that they're implementing. And what you can see from here is that uh, the countries, you will notice there's a number of different European countries, but all the partner countries are uh, in Africa. So North Africa uh, mainly, but also Sub-Saharan Africa. This is because at the time the planning framework was, um, was geographically limited to specific countries. It was, there was a list of specific countries. Now, in the meantime, the European Commission already for our second call for proposals that was published last year, um, we already have a broader geographic focus. That means, and uh, of course, Mario is here today also to speak about a new project, the first pilot project in the East, that is of course also very interesting for this audience today um, so there are th this was the beginning and i think a lot of the lessons that we'll be presenting today are very relevant because they're they're universal but there is also uh yeah uh, an, an an openness let's say from or there has been from the european commission to to open this up and also include uh partners in the east uh, because of course uh, yeah this is of course very important uh let me just also briefly say something about the role of the MPF. What do we exactly do when, when, we, when we say we accompany these projects? Basically, we help them uh, designing it. We're usually involved already at the design phase of the partnership. Uh, we, we accompany them in the process, which means we have regular conversations with them throughout. It's the member states who are really in the lead in these projects. They are implementing in a, usually in a consortium of partners. But they basically consult with us. We, we, we try to provide them with advice and opportunities to connect to each other. We try to take stock of the progress, uh, report back to the commission about how things are going and try to also generate lessons learned and present them to a wider audience like today to, to help contextualize and, and make the best of, of basically of, of all the precious uh, experiences that they're making in these pilot projects. That's why they're pilot uh, projects. Um, yes. I'll also just briefly mention that uh, all the things I'll, I'm saying today are actually part of a, a, a longer analysis that we conducted in the team, uh, an overview of the lessons learned from the pilot projects, which has been published in a policy brief called uh, Partnerships for Mobility at the Crossroads. You can download it on the MPF website. So for those of you who are interested in further details on this after this presentation, feel free to consult this document. It has a lot of uh, uh, more details on, on the different and examples from the different projects. Now, without further ado, I'll dive into the actual lessons that we have gathered and the, the learnings, uh, because I think it, 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 it's very important also, of course, for the, for the Commission colleagues as they are designing the new talent partnerships to take these points into consideration. Um, 
one of the most important things that we have learned is that projects need uh, time, flexibility, and an enabling environment to do their work. And I think this will also be very relevant for the talent partnerships because the talent partnerships are supposed to create all that and basically uh, create this enabled environment for, for such initiatives to work. So we have really seen that uh, it's very challenging initially for these projects to work. Um, they're by nature complex. They involve a multitude of stakeholders because uh, usually different uh, government entities are involved on two sides, on the partner country side and on the uh, country of destination. We see that, of course, on migration and especially on labor migration, different ministries are competent. Ministries of labor, ministries of uh, interior or home affairs, uh, ministries of foreign affairs. And so uh, for a mobility pilot to actually materialize, these different stakeholders have to at least have a minimum of understanding about the topic and the willingness, of course, a political willingness also to invest in such initiatives. Um, and, and this is not always as easy as it may seem. Um, on top of that, we of course have private actors who are st important stakeholders in these mobility projects. Companies who are willing and eager to to share to to fill their labor shortages. We have associations of employers, chambers of commerce. Uh, we also have labor unions, for example. Uh, we have diaspora organizations, NGOs. So all of them usually have to come together to make such a project work, and they're not always used to working with each other. So building trust and preparing a partnership well, including also investing in research. Uh, research about the labor market, about the potential um, uh, for, for our mobility project is really crucial for the success of a project. And also once implementation starts, the flexibility, we have to allow for flexibility in the implementation. We have seen in all these projects uh, that uh, in order to for them to stay relevant for also the changing dynamics of the labor market, they really have to, yeah, to be able to, to, to respond to changes very quickly. Let me just give you an example. Um, for example, the Belgium project, there's an, it's, a, a, it's called Palim. It uh, targets the ICT sector and works with Morocco and uh, Belgium to basically uh, hire and attract um, uh, ICT, young ICT graduates to work as software developers. And it has a dedicated training component uh, for to enhance the skills of the, the uh, ICT uh, graduates after they uh, graduate and from their university courses in Morocco. Now, even just the adapting the, the curriculum for the training for these software developers had to be adjusted several times because the companies that the project consulted with in Belgium, basically the, the demands for it changes, the programming languages, for example, changed and, and they realized that they needed to make adjustments and uh, add components along the way. And so this, these are really um, uh, important things to keep in mind when planning and budgeting uh, for these projects. And also, of course, uh, for donors who fund these projects, because uh, we have to stay very responsive. Um, the consultations also take a lot of time involving uh, many of our projects involve the private sector, for example, through advisory bodies. Uh, all of this takes time and resources from staff to invest in, in this trust building and preparation and, and constantly also uh, engaging with the private sector so that they, that they stay interest, interested. Um, and finally, the enabling environment, which is really key. And this is uh, really basically the, the network that holds all these actors together and the, the, the formal structures that are available for them to come together and consult with each other are really important. So we really see that there's still not enough, also for new projects to form in many countries, there's not really a place or a, a time where all these stakeholders can come together to discuss. So uh, we see that you know organizations such as ICMPD, but also others uh, and the European Commission can continue to play a role in uh, facilitating uh, spaces for conversation, facilitating also um, pieces of research uh, to, to ensure that information is there, that, uh, that uh, those who are interested to develop partnerships actually have the tools in their hands to, to, to continue and to, to work on it. Um, I already touched briefly upon the role of private and public actors. It's really important to involve them from the design phase. Uh, without the private sector and their contributions and them hiring the people and actually contributing financially to these projects, there is no sustainability in these projects. They're uh, otherwise very costly. And so we really need to increasingly, as we move forward, um, uh, 
allow for uh yeah for for them to get involved from the beginning and also to demonstrate how they can contribute financially from the beginning uh and this there it also plays an important role to try to find out what motivates the private sector to join such projects uh for example we have a project uh, run by lithuania in nigeria and it's um uh, and there what we have heard from our partners implementing the project is that the motivations when they started consulting with the companies who were interested in hiring a Nigerian software developers uh, was that it was not necessarily just about filling the labor shortage. For them, it was also about internationalizing their companies in a sector that very much depends on international connections and business uh, with other countries. And so for them, hiring from abroad was actually a way of making sure that employees improve their English, existing employees, or that you know the company culture changes a bit and becomes more open to a more international way of working. So this was kind of a surprise because um, yeah, many expected that it would be mainly about them you know, being desperate for talent, and of course they are, but there are other motivations that may uh, also uh, motivate them to join. And this is important as, as uh, coalitions are built for such projects. And there again, you know, the lack of dedicated time and space for such engagement is a problem and it, it, these preparatory phases into these projects are really necessary to to consult and to make sure that you we design the projects in a way that is responsive to the needs of of the market. The matching process. Uh, so the, the matching process is really also a tricky one uh, where when you have to match the skills from the country of origin to the country of destination. There's a lot that can go wrong, and not just at the at the big picture level, but of course also, uh, you know, at individual candidate level, it's very resource intensive to select still because companies are really interested. They want to be part of every interview, of course, check every um, uh, candidate themselves. The hiring procedures are long, especially when you have to commit to bringing somebody from far away. So uh, it's important to factor in time for this, and also try to envision. Uh, interesting tools and new and modern uh, kind of like tools that help the systematized skills matching. So there's uh, nowadays a lot of uh, new software that is being developed that can help actually match both at levels of, for example, public employment services that can cooperate with each other, but also uh, at, at, you know, just a company level where uh, uh, you can use a tool to uh, organize the recruitment remotely, for example. The COVID crisis, of course, has also brought a lot of new innovation in that sense, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Finally, really important, the recognition of skills and qualifications is critical. We have seen that that can be a real bottleneck for the mobility projects to, to work. Um, sometimes everything is ready the visas are ready and uh but the start of a, a placement for example in a company cannot begin because the recognition takes so long and so these are also things that uh, through these projects and i expect also through the talent partnerships as they develop into bigger uh, policy frameworks it's really important not to forget to also uh, give dedicated time and resources to the development of frameworks at systemic level between the countries to improve these um structures so that mobility initiatives can actually work and do their 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 jobs and and and, and function and satisfy the needs of of the partners involved in the labor market a couple of words on the impact of COVID-19. Um, it has been, of course, a really strange time for mobility projects. Specifically, the last year has severely upended, of course, uh, a lot of the projects. Many of the mobilities did not materialize because of the COVID crisis or had to be postponed postponed but we do see that there's varied impact it very much depends on the project's target sectors on the stakeholders on the local context uh, and it's not just mobility that is affected it's of course also for example reintegration outcomes that can be quite uh, heavily affected we have one project that was uh, aimed at it, it it basically gave academic mobility opportunities for for university students but there was a very strong reintegration component for them to return to their country of origin, in this case, Morocco, to, um, to start projects. And, and the project had initially planned to connect them to donors and private sector initiatives in the countries that now were heavily impacted by the COVID crisis. And of course, it was not their priority then to participate in such projects. And so this we have seen that can be quite, uh, it cannot, it's not just the mobility, it's also the reintegration that sometimes uh, suffers. Uh, we also see that, you know, the more diverse some of the um, uh, projects have covered different sectors, and that, of course, has given them some 
leeway and an opportunity to move around a little bit because some some sectors are more heavily affected than others. Uh, ICT has been, for example, a field that you know uh, in some in some areas of the ICT sector there has been a big increase in demand and a big, big increase in demand for labor as well during the crisis because of all the online tools that we're now using, but uh, it, it very much depends. Or for example, there's, uh, and this brings me to the essential sectors. Uh, there are certain sectors that of course have realized how um, how dependent they are on migrant labor, the health sector, the agriculture sector. And so there it actually has exacerbated uh, existing kind of shortages and has pressed governments to try to address these problems uh, sooner rather than later. Um, here too, it's it, the COVID crisis has shown that we need a better digital infrastructure to enable also, you know, the better com com compatibility between labor market information systems and skills matching platforms between countries of origin and countries of destination. And uh, there's of course also a lot of opportunities that come out of this. Uh, for example, remote working has emerged as an interesting kind of uh, alternative for companies. For example, if they want to start working with someone but are not yet sure if they really want to go through the trouble of bringing them all the way um some projects have have started kind of a a hybrid uh, employment where at the beginning they partner the the employee is still based in the country of origin and uh, has a little bit of time to prepare the actual mobility so uh, also training of course can take place remotely now much more easily so so these this in there are also a lot of very interesting opportunities that came out of the covid 19 crisis uh Research, monitoring, and evaluation. This is one of my last points, but a really important one as we are moving forward with this framework. And as the commission is also now designing the talent partnerships, uh, it's really important to start creating a really dedicated monitoring and evaluation framework for these projects. Uh, they are very specific and different from just usual development cooperation projects. Uh, and we need measurable qualitative objectives and indicators for them to make it visible to make all the contributions that they make actually uh, visible. Uh, I'm, I'm, what I mean by this is that, for example, a mobility project beyond just moving X number of people, um, uh, it, it, it forms you know, partnerships and, and invests in kind of, uh, it, it, it makes us realize where important bottlenecks are. And so even if problems emerge in these projects and we see obstacles and things going wrong, we actually see this as important learnings and important diagnostic tools so that we can we know where to invest and where to uh, put our resources in the right place in order to make such projects work in the future. So these kind of um, more qualitative aspects of what these projects can bring also should somehow be captured in, in the way we monitor and evaluate the success of a project. And also, I mean, as we scale up, of course, it's really important to, to, to look at what success looks like. What do we want to reach with these projects in the future? Um, and, and, and so there, I really uh, yeah, invite us, uh, us all to also reflect together today uh, on you know, beyond the numbers, uh, um, what, what do we want to get out of these? Uh, I, what we have seen is definitely that there's uh, there are really interesting tools to advance bilateral and regional cooperation and legal migration overall. They can really bring partner countries together, uh, also for them to realize that there are common challenges and basically, yeah, win-win situations that they can address uh, together and that they can work on labor migration in a mutually beneficial way that is not uh, exploitative. Uh, or, or you know one-sided and so this is really the goal or for these projects and I, I think also as we look uh, forward to the talent partnerships something we should keep in mind so uh, a short summary of our recommendations that we have uh, gathered together with our partners that are implementing the pilot projects allow for time and flexibility we need at least three to five years of implementation time for such uh, projects uh, we need to be very careful when we design these projects because there's a lot of added value elements uh, such as training, such as reintegration, integration, kind of like initiatives, mentoring, uh, um, uh, capacity building, institutional capacity building that can be audit, added and make these projects much richer. But of course, if you look at sustainability and kind of like uh, the likelihood of such a project to be then taken forward by the private sector, for example, on their own, 
there has to be a certain simplicity of design for it to be successful. So it's really important, I think, to design the different stages and where we invest right now and where we're heading to see how it could eventually lead to a, a scheme that will be self-sustaining. Uh, we also need a diversification of approaches for the time being, and uh, I'm really glad Marco already mentioned it. I mean, the Commission is really committed to also cover more than just highly skilled migration through these projects at the moment, especially those that we're working on are really focused on the highly skilled migrants. Uh, but there's such a big need uh, uh, for lower and medium skills in the different member states. And so also there's so many different approaches, circular, permanent, and uh, and also just uh, the difference between uh, skills mobility and, and more like labor related mobility, we need to continue to have this diverse uh, project so that we can keep testing and keep finding out there's a lot of different needs that need to be covered uh, with these projects. We also need to continue to invest in capacities on both sides actually to uh, support the effective skills matching and a systemic approach. Uh, there is still uh, a lack of appropriate institutional and legal frameworks, so none of these practical projects can go without, uh, you know, also some legal reform and some member states and often it's at member state level to to make these projects more efficient and such schemes more efficient and coordination has to be supported, especially when we're working a lot of different countries from the European Union are uh, working with one partner country it's really important to coordinate to speak to each other to make sure that you know, uh, we have a, a kind of a joint approach also as European Union member states together and coordinate with each other. And then finally, what I already said, foster an enabling environment. We still need to learn a lot and need opportunities such as this one today and many others that that partners and ICMPD and, and, and their partners are involved in to create uh, opportunities for us to engage with the private sector, with other key actors uh, and, and jointly define what success looks like and uh, how, how we can get there together. Uh, I think you know what's next. Uh, the talent partnership we already heard uh, is, is being, the, the, they are being developed and we hope they will be grounded on reflections from the past. Uh, we uh, hope that these uh, pilot projects and their work, and they're not yet finished, so we, were, we will still continue to draw more conclusions and have more insights later on. Uh, that they help us uh, kind of uh, understand the, the limits and but also the opportunities of labor migration practices in Europe. Uh, uh, they are a basis to design new tools and continue to foster kind of like a sustainable cooperation on the topic. Um, maybe just a few words about the new project that we have launched, uh, because indeed we finally have a project in the Eastern Partnership uh, run by Slovakia uh, in Moldova, and I'm so glad that Mario is here today to speak to you about that in more, more detail, so I, I, I won't lose time on that anymore. We also have other projects with other uh, European member states and partner countries in Africa again, and uh, there will be a new call for proposals. Uh, we are working on the criteria in cooperation with the uh, European Commission on the funding criteria, so uh, more information about that will be will come in the coming months. But uh, so we are happy to see that there is a kind of um, continued commitment from the Commission to invest in such initiatives and uh, hope that uh, these uh, learnings today can can be of help for that. And without further ado, I'd like to pass the word to uh, Mario Lelowski who will introduce himself more properly in a moment. Hello, everyone. Thank you for introduction. Allow me, please, to share my screen with my presentation. I would like to share with you today our four, year, four years of experience working with Ukrainian ICT students and graduates, and uh, mostly to present our project for Moldova, Talents for Moldova. A few words about myself. I'm the director of uh, Digital Coalition of Slovakia, which is the national digital coalition for uh, digital skills and digital jobs. Also acting as a vice president of IT Association of Slovakia and the vice president of Slovak National Union of Employers. Due to the fact that we are currently facing the shortage of ICT specialists, we have started four years, uh, the project with uh, Ukrainian universities and Slovak universities. We got, I think, a quite long-term experience from this project, which we would like to use uh, in our further activities. This project was implemented by Digital Coalition, which compromises of uh, 
employers, uh, employers associations, and employers as a companies, also uh, NGOs and uh, the state uh, representatives. We have started with a project where we are working with the master double degree joint study program, which allows to for uh, for Ukrainian uh, students to receive a double degree, which means that they will still finish their master study in ICT or related uh, subjects uh, and study programs in Ukraine. So they receive their original uh, diploma, which allows them to work further in in Ukraine and also on Slovak University, they obtain when they finish the study, they get the Slo Slovakian uh, diploma, which allows them to work uh, anywhere around uh, European Union. This is uh, oriented for uh, for a master study, which means that uh, first year of study is uh, is completed in Ukrainian University during this uh, first year of master study. A program uh, the, the students are receiving the Slovak language basic uh, skills and also continuing with the programming skills like uh, Java or C++ and so on. Then there is a, a summer, summer school for two months in Slovakia where the students re receive the further Slovak language courses, English language courses as well as uh, programming courses in order to prepare them for the last year of master study program which is provided by the Slovak University. And next to that, there is 50-50 uh, practicing at the Slovak ICT companies, not only ICT, but also banks or savings institutions uh, oriented uh, for ICT, ICT practice. Uh, this program we have started uh, in uh, 2016. As you can imagine, it's quite complicated to get at attention from uh, important uh, Ukrainian universities. So we have uh, spent two years of meetings, presentations, discussions, uh, explanation of what we are going to do. Exactly as Diana said, uh, it's very important to, to find a way how to uh, perceive the, the, the problem of uh, brain drain, which we have uh, explained mostly the case that the, the graduate receives the two year practice and one year of study in the European Union, and then is free to go to come back as he obtained also the original um, diploma in Ukraine universities or stay to work in the uh, European Un Union. Or what already happened, that uh, thanks to the contacts in Slovakia company, this company expanded to, to Ukraine their activities, uh, particularly through the graduate uh, who was practicing at the Slovak University. We have started in Kharkiv. Later on, we continue with uh, cooperation in universities in uh, Kiev, Lviv, Odessa, Chernevci, and uh, also with uh, Uzhorod. So based on this experience, we can say that uh, it was quite successful. You can see here uh, a group of, uh, of uh, students who are currently finishing their study in Slovakia. I think uh, the project is very su successful thanks to the, the, the combined offer that we do not forget the original country, we do not forget their original contacts, and thanks to the double degree and double diploma, they are allowed to, to work all around the world uh, in, uh, in the ICT, ICT uh, specialization. Regarding the new project Talents for Moldova, Slovakia is a partner country for Moldova. And uh, thanks to this experience, uh, we were looking for the, uh, to exploit the pillars, which was mentioned by Diana, that we would like to find a way how to help both each other, Moldova and uh, Slovakia. So in general, there is the plan to find uh, 50 and to, to develop 50 mobility schemes with uh, 50 participants uh, and uh, later on uh, continue with, uh, with uh, experience. So uh, if there are any questions regarding the Ukrainian projects, I am uh, uh, free to, to reply. I will not uh, continue too much in detail because there is a lot of experience, a lot of uh, what happened, but I will continue with, uh, with the presentation of the talents uh, for, for Moldova. 
The project is uh, quite large, uh, also a long term, 32 months uh, duration. And we would like to also, thanks to this project, uh, find the way how to develop a, a long, long term uh, labor migration scheme in a legal, a legal way. We are oriented as we are IT, IT uh, association mostly to, to ICT specialization, but uh, not only to that. The consortium of the project, uh, as you can see, there are uh, several partners. First of all, it's a European Migration Agency, which is an NGO located in Bratislava, Slovakia, uh, which helps us to organize uh, international uh, partnerships and the Digital Coalition, which is represented by myself and also by the Moldovan IT Association as, as well. It's very important also to mention that there are included universities in uh, Moldova and also private sector. What we, we see that uh, very important issue, not only Slovakia, also Moldova in many countries, is that uh, the graduate of, a, of the university, whatever he studied, usually is not perfectly prepared for real work. So uh, what we would like to offer is to, to real practice and kind of uh, finalize the graduate, uh, finish the graduate for the real participation in work, work process. So our partners are uh, private companies. We start with the large companies like Orange, which is a telecommunication operator, and ESET, which is the largest IT company in Slovakia. It's a worldwide company for uh, uh, cybersecurity issues and antivirus anti um, uh, programs. Our partners are as well as Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs in Slovakia, then Ministry of Investment, Regional Development and Informatization. And on the Moldovan side, it's a Ministry of Economy and Infrastructure of Republic of Moldova. What are the project objectives? Uh, we would like to enable Moldovan participants to strengthen their social capital and also acquire new skills in stimulating work environment. As I said, we see as people from companies and owners of companies that uh, there is still a room to, to finish the, uh, the graduate, as I said. Of course, we are fa facing the continuing shortage of skilled labor in Slovakia, particularly in ICT. ICT sector, I see as a fastest growing sector, okay, next to pharmacy, unfortunately, these, these days. But uh, in general, ICT is probably the fastest growing sector in uh, all parts of, uh, of Europe and also in the world. And we see that there will be long-term shortage. Although there are a lot of activities uh, in uh, European Commission, particularly with digital coalitions, a lot of other, other issues, but I see that uh, uh, European Union will not uh, cover the needs of ICT specialists for coming 10 to 15 years, unless something great happens, hopefully. So uh, legal migration should help a little bit of this and also should help uh, Moldovan ICT sector, which is also growing and growing fast. And uh, what we have found out during our first visit of Moldova, that the international experience and working in international companies is something which is missing. This is what we would like to, to offer to, uh, to participants of the project, means supporting business development and relations also between private companies in both countries, which is the next issue we would like to develop. We expect uh, Slovak companies to expand to Moldova, and we also see the room for expansion of Moldovan companies to, to European Union countries, where the experienced uh, employees always uh, required. Regarding the key project components, these were uh, as, as obvious, uh, building a public-private partnership and institutional capacity building. Of course, without uh, promotion would be, it would be difficult. So we have to invest in promotion in Moldovan side to find partners, to find participants. And then uh, we would like to include also the talent incubator in uh, Moldova and company placement in Slovakia to find the right companies for, uh, for participants. And uh, next to that, uh, we expect the return and reintegration into the labor market of Moldova, either to work in the companies, international companies, or to start the, the own uh, business.
which is also very much uh, expected. Regarding the pre-phase, uh, our pre-departure phase, uh, we of course have to find out the, the assessment and these uh, agreements with, uh, with companies. Uh, as companies are expected to offer either three months internship or 12 months uh, practice. Then of course we have to run information campaign in both Slovakia and Moldova. We have to find and then the select uh, participants. What we are planning to do is a six weeks training for participants in a talent incubator in Moldova, kind of a preparation uh, for, uh, for this project. Uh, we would like to offer an intensive uh, programming course, also some preparation for Slovak language. It's, it's always good that the participant uh, or the, the student who comes or graduate who comes to foreign country got some basic skills in the language of the of the country of arrival we expect to find uh, 50 moldovan uh, talents uh, who will be uh, then uh, after the, this uh, this uh, pre-departure phase uh, selected and they will be offered with 12 months employment or three months of internship in ict companies in slovakia next to that is the mobility phase uh, we would like to use also another eight weeks of training in talent incubator in Slovakia. We are discussing with uh, two incubators located in, uh, in uh, Slovakia in, in Bratislava. Of course, there is a workplace mentoring. So every international or ICT company always requires some introductory period of the, the new coming person. So this will take some time and uh, Later on, we will continue with the uh, intensive training on uh, language and ICT skills for, uh, uh, for participants. Then there will be 12 months uh, uh, short-term employment contract. During this, uh, this period, we expect the participants to integrate themselves in a, in a working lifestyle of, of ICT companies, either international or local Slovak. Slovak ones, uh, they believe that uh, the internalization uh, part of this uh, project is also important for our companies. We received a lot of requests from uh, international uh, subsidiaries of uh, companies in Slovakia to offer them not only Slovak graduates or, or Slovak employees, but also to internalize the, the, the teams. Regarding the return and reintegration phase, uh, we of course uh, will offer the support with return phase uh, regarding the integration into Moldovan labor market. Uh, we would like to cooperate with the uh, ATIC, with the Moldovan IT Association to find the right uh, positions and offers for participants. And of course, if there is uh, an effort or if there is uh, a need uh, to help with startup activities, there is a startup uh, incubator in Moldova and Kishinev and uh, Kahul, where we can find partners. We already agreed that they will also help with uh, startup activities when there is a new, new uh, company started. Regarding the startup grants, we probably can help with uh, the project which is already running in a city Kahul where the Innovation and Technology Center is acting as a supporting scheme for startups. Regarding the capacity building, uh, we expect uh, to build capacities in local partners on both sides in Slovakia and uh, Moldova. And we expect also this scheme might be sustainable for the future. And we hope that uh, through this uh, project, we will find enough partnerships between companies, between universities and uh, associations to continue with such activities uh, for the future. So that's uh, all from my side. I am ready to reply any questions. I would like to thank you as ICMPD and European Commission that they are supporting such projects. I think it's very important for all of us to build on a fair and legal labor migration. Thank you very much.
it's a very blurry line, I, I would say, between additional and existing legal pathways, because in a way, um, I do think I, I do think it's 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 correct to still say that the projects have aimed uh, and 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 continue to aim at additional safe and legal pathways, because what we see is that. Uh, Yes, indeed, there's existing pathways that are underutilized, but there are also uh, opportunities to create new uh, new ones. And I think that uh, a lot of the learnings from our projects, and especially as they are really now finalizing, uh, and as those who have, for example, identified bottlenecks and have identified uh, basically through research where there would be still so much more potential for migration to take place, but there is no available legal pathway. I think one of the definitely of the conclusions and recommendations will be to try to create uh, new pathways and, and adapt the existing ones to, to be able to be accessed by more people. I'll just give you an, a concrete example. For example, we have a new project run by Belgium with uh, Senegal, and it's about the mobility of entrepreneurs. Uh, this is something that in the past, I think was just not as much on, um, on authorities' radars. So there is a, an existing visa that entrepreneurs could potentially use, but it's a bit uh, kind of a borderline case because, uh, Actually, it's for businessmen and for people who are already associated to a big company, for example, a manager from a big company, there are certain criteria and supporting documents that they have to submit in order to be able to travel on such a visa. And so what the Belgians uh, did is that they identified this as a kind of a possible legal pathway, but that has not really been in the in the institutional practice, how they are uh, processing the visa has not really been used to grant access for entrepreneurs or, for example, for startuppers, people who are just about to start their company. And so they're, through this project, they are trying to kind of uh, adapt that and to actually test for the first time uh, the use of this business visa for entrepreneurs and for uh, uh, soon-to-be entrepreneurs and see if that can change. You know, if the results of this pilot would then inform a potential legal change. Uh, so um, this is the kind of initiatives we're talking about, where it's very much between a, the better use of existing pathways and the creation of uh, new ones. So this very much depends on the national context of the member state that we're speaking about. And usually what we have seen and the projects that we have worked on, so we have two projects that target specifically the ICT sector, that's the Belgian project and the Lithuanian project. Uh, and uh, so it, 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 it very much depends on, on, on the uh, context. In Belgium, for example, the public employment services play a really big role. They have a very comprehensive uh, kind of like already uh, comprehensive research on uh, professions and shortages in the different sectors and which they have a, a list of professions that is in uh, basically that they're in direst need of and based on this list so they use the partners use this list and the public employment services in both Belgium and Morocco were actively involved in in, in the project. And so they use this research and this list to uh, basically identify specific profiles uh, and a specific skills profile where they would want to bring people. Um, in Lithuania, for example, this was a little bit different there. Uh, uh, sometimes we also see in other countries that, uh, for example, there is no systematic data at government level that is necessarily uh, um, uh, kind of like compiled by the government, but for example, there is data from the employ uh, for, from the employers associations. So in the Lithuanian project, uh, the partners worked with the ICT association, and they had data and they had done surveys and research with their members about expectations for uh, hiring in the coming months and years. And so there, they had identified, you know, specific profiles profiles that they will need, and and uh, and uh, yeah, where the gaps are specifically. Uh, so it really depends on the context. And sometimes we see that there's no data available at all. And the project has to themselves come up with a methodology to basically uh, involve the, the relevant authorities and, and partners to, to do this research and find this information. And then in terms of protection, that also is very much a national um, uh, affair, of 
course, most of the countries that we have seen in the European Union have kind of safeguards built into the laws that protect, for example, from dumping of salaries so that there is not, a, 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 so that companies cannot use these projects or recruiting from abroad to undermine existing uh, labor standards and, for example, wage regulations. Um, uh, but we also see that this sometimes adds to immense bureaucratic burdens. So, for example, especially in the ICT sector, that is an issue sometimes because uh, regular frameworks uh, of, for example, qualifications that are needed, uh, diploma, certificates, in order to make sure that the standard is of, 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 of hiring, let's say, is maintained. But this sometimes in the ICT sector where it's very dynamic and people don't always have a diploma or don't always, you know, they have practical experience that they cannot necessarily. So the, this can lead to, so the protection of, uh, of, of uh, work standards is, uh, is really important. And I think all of our projects also have always tried to address it, but we also have seen that it leads to bureaucratic complications. So one of the recommendations actually also that we see emerging in some of the projects are how to make best combine these goals, because of course nobody wants uh, people to be exploited and nobody wants the standards, the high standards existing in the European Union countries to kind of be watered down. So uh, how to best make uh, use of existing regulations or improved regulations in a way that they are still make sense for the companies uh, and that they still respond to the labor market needs and at the same time do not uh, enter, you know, do not uh, Mm, uh, damage uh, 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 the the, mm, the potential uh, for hiring. Uh, and now another important thing to mention in this context, I think, is that labor unions, I think, also do play and will hopefully increasingly play a role in such projects, and that they should be really involved in order to make sure that whatever uh, system is set up, a new system, for example, for migration from abroad, is really uh, compliant with ethical recruitment standards. Uh, so, so it's a really important point uh, to, to pay attention to. I can <laughs> confirm that, uh, that uh, employers associations, particularly ICT associations, uh, I, I know many throughout the European Union as we are a member of Digital Europe, which is the IT association of, of Europe, I think everyone is checking what's going on on the ICT job market, uh, labor market. Uh, this is this is obvious. And secondly, I have to say that uh, it is absolutely impossible to place any discrimination rules on ICT uh, workers. These are high specialized people. They have uh, access to any information. Usually, they are better oriented in a, in a labor market laws and rights than than we are. So uh, I would say there is no, okay, maybe there are some examples, but I am practically sure no one in Europe is able to, to discriminate uh, such workers. I, I, I cannot expect or imagine that. Thanks. This depends on uh, the position of, of the job. As I said, ICT specialists, they usually do not go through any, any agencies or whatsoever. Uh, there, are, there are job offers uh, from a lot of companies available on, uh, on the internet, so they usually can, can tackle particular companies. Of course, there are specialized headhunters. Okay, that's, that's, that's obvious. They can even help them to increase their value on the, on the labor market. Uh, from my point of view, that's, that's not bad. Uh, of course, in, in a different positions, it can be of a help of, of, of uh, incoming employees from, the, from such an agency to help with the integration process, uh, to, to manage all the bureaucratic stuff, uh, which is various from the country to country, which is, I have to say, crazy for me, from my point of view, that throughout Europe, we have in every country different rules. Uh, which is which is very complicated for uh, for uh, a labor uh, labor market immigration. So uh, I would suggest to 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 work with on on that. Uh, I think there are some processes going on thanks also to the to the to the Prague process. So uh, this is this differs. Yeah, but the the higher the position is, I think the the more clever and more oriented the person is. So uh, you usually. It, 
he helps or she helps uh, herself himself. Yeah, mm -hmm. just briefly on the temporary uh, uh, recruitment agencies, uh, our projects so far have not dealt extensively with them or worked with them directly. But I think there's actually a lot of potential to learn from temporary recruitment agencies. And because in, in many ways, what they do is already what these projects are trying to do. And in many ways, they exist because of these complicated frameworks and because companies cannot do it on their own. Uh, they rely on, on them as intermediaries to help them recruit from abroad. So I think there's a lot of potential to uh, work more closely with them, use them, and also regulate them through the process and maybe in some ways make them obsolete almost, you know, because if we had a very simple system whereby companies could hire directly, they maybe would not need them. But uh, it, it, it depends. And, and I think if you, if you regulate it well, they can add value. And uh, governments can use them also in smart ways. So uh, definitely potential to, to explore that. And I think the new generations of project is also looking increasingly into that. I know that the Match IOM project is working with intermediaries in the partner countries that know the markets really well, for example, in Nigeria or Senegal, uh, and they can really help navigate the talent uh, pool, let's say, in the partner countries in ways that uh, people from Europe uh, would never be able to. So this uh, working also with local cooperation partners and uh, agencies and partner countries can be very interesting and meaningful just if we do it in the right way. Yes, certainly. So yes, what I mean with uh, scaling up of the pilot projects um, is simply that um, we are trying to basically see what we have achieved with the pilot projects and, of course, increase the number of beneficiaries, but also the kind of the, the, the kind of capacities that we can build with this. So it's not only about beneficiaries, it's also about investing in the capacities to facilitate mobility over the long term for a large number of people, much larger number of people that we've than we've seen with the pilot projects. I mean, the pilots have been very small in terms of numbers um, because we had to start building capacities. Uh, we, we didn't have that basis yet. So it's we see this as a continuous investment in capacities that will then um, create economies of scale over the long run. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that it's not just about the number of beneficiaries because not necessarily all mobilities would have to take place within or under the framework of a talent partnership in the future. These, these talent partnerships are, um, are trying to stimulate um, a certain you know, facilitation of mobility that could also take on a life of its own outside of talent partnerships and simply happen um, organically. I, uh, I mean, we are also with regard to the previous point, um, on new pathways, we're, we're not creating any sort of new legislation or new instruments with this. This is only designed to support, provide support and assistance to um, member states and, and partner countries in order to facilitate mobility that could already happen now, but is simply not happening because of the obstacles that were mentioned. And um, we're identifying more and more obstacles through these pilot projects and simultaneously identifying how to resolve them. And so scaling up these, um, this, this, this approach simply means um, removing as many obstacles as we can and facilitating these mobilities to a level that would hopefully one day be self-sustaining and um, would no longer require um, a, a significant investment from, you know, from our side, simply because they would already have benefited over a long period of time from support. Um, so this is a kind of an investment based kind of approach um, over the long run. That's why I also mentioned earlier that we're looking at rolling these out gradually, because it will take time for us to reach um, a level of, uh, of capacity that would allow, uh, you know, larger numbers of mobilities to take place. I'll let Marco answer the part about uh, the ambitions of the talent partnerships in that respect. Uh, what we see is that there's a, a need for that, there's demand for that indeed, as you say, also from the partner countries. Um, 
we we see that uh, in some in some uh, areas actually it really prohibits or it it stops actually even projects from developing. Uh, for example, in the health uh, sector, it, it really does it, it does complicate things because there we have very distinct national frameworks already among European uh, uh, member states that are very different from each other, and so sometimes it can really be uh, uh, an obstacle without really uh, willingness from the national authorities that are competent and that are kind of like the, that have to ha show the political desire to make changes. Uh, sometimes projects just don't materialize. So uh, it's it's highly individualized. Uh, uh, what we have seen, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is that it it in our existing project it has mainly materialized in delays and in complications uh, and kind of bureaucratic uh, demands that sometimes uh, are also not. Especially I mentioned already the ICT sector; it's not always actually even very much matching the reality of the sector of what they would need you know uh we had an example and i'll just uh, tell you there was a, a person who had studied in nigeria and he was a very specialized highly uh experienced uh, software developer but he had studied chemistry uh the a couple of years ago and and had never gotten a formal degree in 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 uh, ict in the ict world and so so this actually posed problems then because it was not actually recognized as a relevant degree that would enable him to take up a profession in lithuania in this sector and so um this type of uh, uh of problems uh we have seen most uh, actually come up uh, delays and then kind of like sometimes really just uh, mismatches of the policy and the uh, and yeah and I know that our projects are working on concrete recommendations for their national context that they will uh, publish uh, so we'll definitely also provide with a deeper analysis as the end of the project comes of the projects come nearer yeah maybe to come in um, because i think the question referred to the uh, the talent pool idea which is a complementary element of the new pact um, outside but of course related to the talent partnerships concept and uh, we are still exploring that talent pool uh, how to set it up and what it should look like but the the idea is to create an eu-wide platform for international recruitment which would allow skilled non-eu workers to express their interest in migrating to the eu and could be identified by EU migration authorities and employers based on their needs. Now, the, the issue of skills recognition is, of course, a very important one. But as mentioned um, by Diana, it is um, dealt with at the national level. There are still big differences in recognition. And I'm not sure that we would be able to address that fully on the EU level. But of course, we are aware of this issue and we are, um, I mean, there are, there are multiple actions on the skills recognition side um, which are ongoing for a long time already, trying to um, trying to encourage some sort of harmonization to the extent possible. But um, but yeah, we, it remains to be seen what um, the talent pools would would look like in practice and what they would um, whether they would include a substantial or if any skills recognition um, component. Uh, you know, in ICT world, we can uh, basically easily test our future employees. So if I am looking for Java programmer or some specialist, uh, uh, I can simply test uh, the, the, the future employee and find out whether this is suitable for me or not. We are not really keen on to have diplomas or official authorization of, uh, of the of diplomas. Uh, on the other hand, the authorities and administration requires that for working permits. So uh, you have two issues, uh, maybe, the graduate, uh, there is a graduate from uh, chemistry and still good in ICT, that's open. It's good to have any, any, any diploma or any, any document which allows the permit to the receiving the permit. But uh, this is a kind of obstacle, which I agree. Yeah. And uh, the more obstacle we do, the, then there are, there are countries with, with less obstacles, like Great Britain, for example, so uh, the, the talents then are forming and moving to the countries where there is less obstacle. Next to that, um, I uh, would like to mention also Pact of Skills, which is a new large initiative of uh, European uh, Commission, which should uh, uh, bring a kind of a sectorial uh, point of views of employers, particularly employers. Uh, what we think that the certain employee should have as a, a skills, uh, 
a skill set or a competence set. So not what academia is bringing to us. So the academia is actually writing what uh, skill sets, competence sets, they are, uh, the graduates of the study programs will have, but uh, it should be more listened to us employers, what we need. So, and I'm happy of, uh, of this uh, Pact of Skills initiative where there is more voice of employers uh, listened to, or I believe it will be, and there will be sectorial councils established for sectoral uh, jobs uh, descriptions. And these should be kind of unified throughout the European Union. And then it, then it will be much more easier to, to define the set skills and competence skills. The project is running its fourth year. Uh, this year, we are planning to include also the universities from uh, Mykolaiv, for example. Uh, I hope we can continue, although the situation due to the COVID crisis is quite complicated for movement and, and transportation and so on. Uh, and also the study, which is only on a distance form is, I have to say, not that uh, high quality as it would be in, in a present, present uh, way. But uh, nevertheless, we would like to continue. And uh, we are cooperating very closely with uh, the Embassy of Slovakia in uh, Kiev and also with honorary consuls in uh, Kharkiv and Odessa. So we are happy to hear if there is any interest, please contact me. We would like to continue and discuss how to maybe enhance uh, this project. And I will reply to the next question as well. We are not only looking for IC ICT, but we started with ICT as I am and, and all the initiative came from the ICT sector, but uh, we are open to, to any sectors. And we also brought already three Slovak public universities to the cooperation with uh, Ukrainian universities. So I think we can grow up uh, quite much better. Uh, important is also the, the language similarity that uh, for Ukrainian uh, uh, young people, it's quite easy to learn uh, Slovak. Uh, Slovak language, um, basically, if there is a clever student, uh, it takes three months to, to learn at least uh, some basics. So for sure, we try to, to continue and find the best way how to continue. Yeah, of course, it's... Uh, it makes the project more complex. We have to find the right content of the joint study programs. It's not easy yeah? because uh, Ukrainian study programs are not accredited in EU, which we would like to suggest to do, it, do this. So it's a kind of a hard work to unify the study program of a Slovak university, of a Ukrainian university to keep on credits, to keep on content, to really to, to, uh, to ensure the quality and the content uh, uh, sustainability of the of the study program we want to be sure that the graduate really gets the 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 competencies and skills he would need Yes, so we, we expect there will be a new call. Uh, we are discussing the details at the moment still with our partners from the European Commission who are funding this uh, framework and uh, we do not have a set date. Uh, we're hoping it will be soon, but yeah, it, it, it's, it will be in the coming uh, uh, months, I would expect weeks, months uh, for, for it to go live. We do have a, on our website a newsletter uh, button that you can click and that you would receive information about staying up to date if you want to know about a new publication of the call. Uh, yes, well, the, the Commission actually uh, presented a, a revision, a proposed revision of the Blue Card Directive because of um, the low uptake that we saw from member states um, and the limited use of this instrument. Um, so the revision was proposed with the aim of making it easier and more attractive for highly skilled third country nationals to come and work in the EU. Um, and it proposed a number of in 
improvements, including less stringent admissions criteria, such as lower, lower salary threshold and a shorter required length of work contracts, also better family reunification conditions, facilitated mobility, um, and the abolishment of parallel national schemes. Now, there has been a lot of discussion in the Council and Parliament on this. Um, there, those negotiations are still ongoing, and I cannot comment on the status of those negotiations, but um, uh, we hope that the negotiations will be concluded soon and that uh, we can have a revised blue card in place um, hopefully still this year so that we can um, then hopefully attract more highly skilled workers through that scheme but um, but just to point out that this is a very specific instrument specific to uh, highly skilled um, workers and the talent partnerships go well beyond that specific segment um, and they can also I mean the talent partnerships could also be um, implemented using national schemes so it, it's not specific to the blue card. No, unfortunately, we don't have yet uh, information, confirmed information about the budget. Uh, we expect it will be along the lines of uh, oh, the, the amounts that have been invested in the past, uh, but uh, we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot comment on it just now. Yeah.